and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, recording on this uh, Good Friday morning, uh, still drinking my coffee, trying to wake up, trying to recover um, after that excellent result last night. Very pleased, of course. And on this episode, we'll be dissecting that 1-0 win in Naples. The 1-0 win that means Arsenal are now through to the UEFA Europa League semi-finals for the second consecutive season. Joining me on this episode will be Alan O'Brien, the tactics man himself. If you haven't already <laughs> followed his page, do check it out. The link will be in the description below. It's fully worth it for great tactical analysis. And of course, regular contributor Mike Stavry will be joining me on the line too uh, to share his thoughts on that vital win in Naples. Now, my first guest this week is a man I've been trying to get on this show for ages um, due to his unbelievable tactical knowledge. Uh, we finally made it happen. Um, it's Mr. Alan O'Brien. Welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast, my friend. How have you been? I've been good, Harry. Yeah, I've, uh, I'm delighted to finally make it on the show. It's been uh, it's been a while. We've tried to we've tried to connect and get this done, and <laughs> it's exciting to finally appear on the Chronicles. That's right. And, and you know what? We've been trying to get Alan on for so long, and Alan wasn't initially going to watch uh, the Napoli Arsenal second leg, and he kind of volunteered and said, "Yes, I'll do it. I'll watch it, and I'll come on the show." And for that, we are super grateful. But I just want to apologise to Alan on air because it was a dire game for a neutral to watch, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty dreadful. All right. Although, to be fair, there was there was a possibility in the first half that it could have become very interesting, contrary to my expectations. Because, as you well know, Harry, Napoli missed two clear-cut chances in the first half hour. And if those two chances had been taken, we could have been level on ag aggregate and it could have been a far different contest. But Absolutely. as it stood... The second half was was a non-event due to Lacazette's goal. Absolutely, totally agree with you. I thought, uh, looking at the initial team selection, of course, Unai Emery went with checking goal. He went with the back three, Koscielny, Socrates, Monreal, the two wing-backs, Maitland-Niles, Kolasinac, and then a midfield of Xhaka, Torreira, with Aaron Ramsey ahead of them, and then, of course, the two strikers. Now, before the game, I was calling for Unai Emery to start with the two strikers. I wanted to see Arsenal take the game to Napoli and get the job done early doors. And the reason for that is not because I'm overconfident, not because I'm cocky as an Arsenal fan and I feel that we have a right to go to Naples and blow them off the park, but simply because I don't trust Arsenal to defend any type of lead, um, given the way we've defended this season, particularly away from home. Was you surprised, Alan, to see Unai Emery go with such a bold approach from the off? Yeah, I was, I was mildly surprised, although I think since his tenure at Sevilla during his time at PSG and, and at Arsenal, he has been quite aggressive as a manager, Emery. But nonetheless, I was mildly surprised that he went with the with the 3 4 one, two, with the two strikers, Lacazette and Aubameyang. And I was also surprised with the manner in which he went about the game in, in the opening minutes. Uh, he was still intent on pressing Napoli's 4 4 2 uh, in the Napoli half and there was a, a clear intention as well to uh, get men forward in attack which was I suppose a risk and it was a risk that almost backfired on him uh, with the two clear-cut chances that Napoli created early on. Yeah I mean you're absolutely right it could have been very different had Napoli found an early goal you know the crowd would have got behind them and all of a sudden you, you sort of backs up against the wall and we've seen that you know Arsenal are not the best at, you know, sitting back and soaking up pressure. But I think you're right. I think Unai Emery was very bold. I think he's been very aggressive of late. And I think that's been, you know, partly why our form has upturned. Because for me, one of my criticisms of Unai Emery has been this season that in the away games, we've been too negative. We've gone to certain places where we should have gone out and played football and not done that. Well, this showed, didn't it, that if you do that, you know, yes, you need a little bit of luck along the way. You need that when you play good quality teams like Napoli. But Arsenal, in the end, uh, got the first half goal and ultimately killed off the tie. And I mean, Alexander Lacazette's free kick. I don't think anybody saw that coming. I, I certainly didn't. In fact, I expected Granit Xhaka to, to be the man to hit it. So uh, was you surprised to see that fly in the back of Merritt's goal? Well, I was surprised because uh, I read a statistic there, Harry, in, in the last few hours that indicates that that's 
Arsenal's first direct free kick goal in Europe in 15 years, 16 years, excuse me, since uh, Thierry Henry scored one against Roma, apparently. Yes, and I remember that well. <laughs> well, you're, you have a better memory than me because I was I was surprised to read that. Uh, it's, it's some statistic. But um, it was also surprising given that Lacazette's performance in the opening half hour was, was quite poor by his standards. I do think that he's a better... Uh, he's a more complete striker than Aubameyang. He's a better link man. Uh, but he didn't show it in, in the first half an hour against Napoli. Uh, he was uh, giving the ball away quite frequently. I thought he'd benefit Arsenal's uh, general play uh, a bit better by his inclusion because certainly when Aubameyang was fielded alone against Watford on Monday, I think um, Arsenal struggled to make the ball stick in the final third and, and create patterns of play in that area of the pitch. But um, yeah, ultimately he got that goal and really did nothing else apart from that. Yeah, he ultimately killed off the tie, didn't it? It was the decisive goal in the end. And, you know, Arsenal fans were very grateful. And particularly myself, I breathed a sigh of relief when that went in. You know, I was sitting watching it with some friends um, and, and they all sort of leapt out of their seats in jubilation as the ball hit the back of the net. Whereas my reaction was like more of a, like to exhale and be, uh, you know, relieved that that ball didn't, that, that that ball, sorry, had gone in the back of the net and now the tie was was almost out of reach for Napoli and they'd need four goals from that. Um, Alan, what have you made of Arsenal's progress under Unai Emery this season? Because I know you're a neutral, so you're a little bit more detached from the situation. I guess you don't get angry like some of us do. You don't get over-emotional um, after seeing certain performances. So how would you assess the way he's taken this team on? Has there been improvement? And if so, in terms of like a percentage how much would you say this team has improved under his stewardship? Well, I don't know about a percentage, but I do think there has been a, a clear and significant improvement this season. I mean, that's borne out in, in, in the points tally, for one. Um, and it's also borne out in the fact that Arsenal are still in with a, a good shout of getting a top four place. Um, however, I do think that Emery has had large slices of luck at the time, at times. If you look at the uh, the 20 plus game on beaten run that uh, Arsenal went on earlier in the season in all competitions, many of those games, if you looked at the XG uh, tallies, uh, went in Arsenal's favour rather fortunately. They benefited in, in many of those games from from some very good finishing from the likes of Aubameyang, who went on a freakish run where every shot he took seemingly went in. You know, yeah. um, but having said that, to go back to my original point. Uh, luck aside, there has been a significant improvement. Uh, we can see that Arsenal, the biggest thing, the biggest difference for me, Harry, uh, with Arsenal since Emery took over is that they're a lot more tactically flexible now and at times too tactically flexible. I mean, if I think back to the one all drawn St. Stephen's Day or Boxing Day, as you call it over there, against <laughs> uh, against Brighton, yeah, uh, that to me was, was the ultimate example uh, and I think Watford on Monday night was was perhaps the second worst example of how Emery can be too uh, tactically kind of ADHD at times. I think he <laughs> used four systems against Brighton, that one all draw. Uh, and every time he made a tactical change, Arsenal got worse. Uh, and when you look at how Brighton free fell after that, it's a terrible result. And it was the same on Monday night against Watford. He oscillated, I think, three or four times between 3-4-2-1 and 4-2-3-1. And the players looked completely bamboozled. And against a 10-man side, uh, Arsenal were quite awful, in fact. I mean, Watford were, were quite unlucky not to get something from the game. Uh, but then, uh, on the other hand, Harry, I'm criticising him for being too tactically inflexible. But you also look at the early part of the season, uh, and indeed some of the results in, in the latter part too. How many games has Emery turned around by making changes at halftime and by being proactive. So I'm criticising him on one hand for being too quick to change, but on the other hand, unlike Arsene Wenger, he is willing to make changes that sometimes come off stupendously. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Alan. And, you know, there are times where I get quite a lot of stick for doing this show because I've said those exact things that maybe we're too eager to change tactics maybe it's confusing maybe we don't seem to be able to settle into a rhythm in certain games because of that but 
on the other hand, there have been games where it's worked. You're absolutely right. I totally agree with you there. And it's refreshing to hear that from somebody as well who, who's as knowledgeable as yourself. And I, I think there's a real problem at Arsenal in and amongst the fans in the sense that you've got... You, you had the divide when Arsene Wenger was there. You had Wenger out, Wenger in. Now you've got... You've still got a divide. You've got those who were Wenger out are a little bit afraid of criticising Unai Emery because it kind of makes them look hypocritical for, for all the things they said last season. And then you've got the other half who, you know, they, they're they still... Uh, what's the word? Wenger loyalists, I would call them. And they still, um, you know, will pick on everything Unai Emery does wrong. I think you need to be somewhere in the middle. And I think... That's where you're coming from. I think you need to look at the good points and the bad points. And you need to accept that this is a work in progress and it's not going to be perfect straight away. Um, another thing that I've said repeatedly in the recent months, and I've, I've been hammered for it, is that we're in the, the, the race for the top four, um, partly down to the fact that we've improved and partly down to the, the circumstances around us. Manchester United, obviously, were 11 points behind us before Ole Gunnar Solskjaer took over. Tottenham have, have dropped off a little bit in terms of their Premier League performances and hence why they're in the mix again. Chelsea have not had their greatest season. So whilst you could only beat what's in front of you and compete what's, uh, you know, the, the teams the, compete against the teams you're up against, there is a bit of, you know, you need to look at the context of things. And I think people miss the context of stuff when analysing football. Would you agree or not? Sure, yeah. I mean, look, without trying to sound condescending, I think most football fans resist a kind of an analytical approach to the game. For, for most football fans, I think it's entertainment. And that's fine. I mean, that's a completely valid way to engage with the game. Um, for me... I suppose, coming from this, the background I come from, which is that I'm a maths graduate, a maths lecturer. Um, I've always been a kind of a, an obsessive when it comes to statistics and, and trying to understand things. And so, you know, perhaps it's easier for me, therefore, to kind of resist the, uh, the narrative approach that even some journalists take, where it's all about the story and you kind of miss the detail. And I think, you know, any group of fans that is completely anti-Emery or completely pro-Emery are missing the detail because there's pros and cons to, to his tenure so far. But I do think that the pros outweigh the cons. I mean, if you look at the, the pre-season, uh, the Arsenal players were were so enthused at the fact that a manager had came in and he was he was actually coaching them how to press properly, which is something that um, Arsene Wenger never did. We had a situation where Arsenal were uh, trying to close down the opposition high up the pitch and weren't doing it effectively and we're getting caught in behind all the time if you recall of course you yeah. recall I mean you probably have nightmares about it we this suffered day. from it for years mate <laughs> yeah but uh, you know immediately he made an improvement to that and I mean if you look at the two legs against Napoli Harry uh, many of the chances Arsenal created and it's been the same all season were from uh, counter pressing Napoli after they lost the ball after Arsenal lost the ball uh, Torreira's goal in the first leg for example uh, Fabian Ruiz who had a tough night again last night he was moved out to the left but he was in the centre in the first leg he was caught by Torreira and Torreira scored a deflected goal the second goal and last night the only clear cut chance Arsenal created in a pretty terrible performance also came from midfielder Mkhitaryan robbing Allen my namesake <laughs> in uh, in the Napoli half if you remember Aubameyang should have yeah. scored and yeah. made it even more comfortable so that's been an aspect of Arsenal's play that has been like transformed, is the press. Now, at times, the high line that goes with a press has been breached. It was breached an awful lot last night, particularly um, with long balls. And that's down, I think, to, to the fact that this is a big problem. This is one of the cons, Harry, that the defence are being pulled from back five to back four all the time. And we saw last night that that's not having a good effect on their coherence, on how cohesive they are. Because even though Arsenal caught Napoli offside six times last night, four times in the opening quarter, all of those times, I thought, were luck. Poor timing of the run from Insigne. Yeah. We saw that the five defenders were not in position. And I mean, how many times in the second half did uh, Ainsley Maitland-Niles play uh, a Napoli player on side, particularly the left-back they brought on, Mario Rui? So, and Kolasinac is a disaster positionally as well. So, that's one of the cons then, you know, that the offside trap isn't quite working as well. And 
not to go on too long, but another big con for me, Harry, is uh, how poorly Arsenal have transitioned into defence all season. And we saw that very early in the game last night with the chance that Callaghan had when Arsenal had a corner kick and they ended up in a in a, a break situation where Napoli really should have scored the first goal. Yep. The one where Cooley Barley marched forward and carried the ball forward. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's been a hallmark of Arsenal's play all season, go, dating back even to the opening game against, uh, was it Manchester City? Yep, that's right. Yep. Um, very, very slow to get back into shape in the defensive phase, which, which is a, a knock on effect of, of this new pressing style that Emery is trying to inculcate. You mentioned it's a work in progress. But they're very slow to get back into position, particularly in wide areas. And we saw last night when Arsenal switched from the 3-4-1-2 to the 3-4-2-1 that the two wingers, Mkhitaryan and Iwobi, who I suppose to their, in their defence are not really natural wingers, they did not do a good job of tracking their fullbacks. And that's been a, a common complaint, really, for, for Arsenal. Mkhitaryan in particular was, was awful up against uh, Mario Rui, who, um, who really should have got Napoli at least a foothold in the game. I know they needed four goals, but, uh, he, you know, his his delivery was far better than Goulam's and, and Arsenal were lucky not to be punished. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these are all things that do need addressing and I think you're absolutely right to raise them and I think you're absolutely right to say that, you know, these things need to be analysed. And for me personally, uh, I, you know, I, I share your thoughts on all of these subjects. I think you're spot on. I think you've hit the nail on the head on on lots of this and I think that I'll go back to my, my point before I think that people are afraid to criticize this Arsenal team because we've got a new manager and I don't think that's right I don't think you progress in anything if you can't identify the faults and you know just because we're raising them it doesn't mean that we're not in support of the manager and we're not supportive of, of the work that he's trying to do so I think you make some great points Alan I completely agree with you how do you see Arsenal's chances now of going on and winning this Europa League do you think that we have a strong chance here. Do you think it's a better chance than we do have of making the top four via the league? Well, I think that uh, you're, you've got a good manager if you want to win the Europa League because in his three full seasons in Sevilla, Unai Emery won it every time. He seems to have uh, some kind of a cosmic relationship with the competition. <laughs> so that's in your favour. They're soulmates, I think, himself in the Europa League uh, trophy. And what also is in your favour is that you, you've just beaten um, an Apple side uh, that's, that's playing a 4-4-2. Um, that 4-4-2 really, really struggled in midfield against the Arsenal press, as we mentioned earlier. They were outnumbered. I was shocked that Carlo Ancelotti stuck with it, actually, last night, given what we saw in the first leg. And in Valencia, under Marcelino, which I believe are your next opponents in the semi-final, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's right, yeah. They, they play in a 4-4-2 as well. Now, the only difference there is that, as you're probably aware, the, we've seen managers have success with 4-4-2s in Europe in recent years. But like with Carlo or um, Claudio Ranieri's version and uh, Diego Simeone's version at, at, at Atletico Madrid, Marcelino's version at Valencia is a lot different to Napoli's in that it is a defensive, counter-attacking, compact version. Napoli suffered against Arsenal because they're trying to use a 4-4-2 with an expansive style, which meant the two central midfielders were completely swamped by Arsenal's three. But Valencia, if you watch their two games against Manchester United this season, when they took four points out of six, they're a lot, a much different beast. They're very, very compact, um, very hard to break down, very narrow. Uh, they won't be as vulnerable to Arsenal's press, but the big problem I can see for them is a vulnerability to width. And that is something that Arsenal have in spades, particularly when they employ the wing backs. Yep. I think Kolasinac is a disaster at left back. He's not a very good defender at all. We mentioned that earlier, but he's a huge threat, a huge threat when he's given the run of the flank. And Aisley Maitland-Niles as well is a far better attacker than he is defender. I think he's a natural midfielder, actually, isn't he? If you look at his youth yeah, career. that's right, yeah. So I think I can see Arsenal prevailing in that tie, you know. The, the, the stars are aligning in their favour. And then if you look at the other semi-final, 
You've got a, an unbelievable Frankfurt side who have just come out of nowhere this season to challenge for top four in Germany and reach the semi of the Europa. They're up against Chelsea, who barely got over the line against Slavia Prague last night, albeit I think people are being too critical of Rizzo Sarri in his opening season, similar to Emery. Yep. Uh, so if you look at how Arsenal did for Chelsea in January, well, probably Arsenal's best performance of the season uh, in that, I think it was 2-0 win over Chelsea. Um, I think absolutely Arsenal have a great chance of winning this competition, Harry. That's exactly what we want to hear, Alan. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, always great to hear, um, you know, about our chances of, of being good, you know, chances of being strong and going all the way in this competition. And, you know, people have been asking this question to me recently. Would I rather finish in the top four or win the Europa League? Well, of course, I'd rather win the Europa League because I'd rather have the silverware and the Champions League qualification. Whilst I think, you know, league position probably gives you a better indication of where you are. Um, you know, of course, you'd love the day out, you'd love the final and you'd love to, to come home with a trophy. Uh, our first European trophy in, I think, almost 25 years. So that would, of course, be the preferred route, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, but Alan, thank you so much for taking the time out to join me. I know you're really, really busy and uh, I know we made you suffer through that. Uh, what's, what word can I use? Mundane uh, second leg <laughs> from a neutral perspective <laughs> anyway uh, so thank you for that we do really really appreciate it do you want to let our listeners know how they can find your website the tactics truck i know it's uh, a great website and you do some really good in-depth tactical analysis on there i certainly read it whenever you cover arsenal as well so let our listeners know how they can find you how they can find you on social media yeah so the big one is my, my twitter account that's um at alan ob 2112 at alan ob 2112 or if you want to visit the website it's simply tactics truck 2.com which is uh, an homage to a terrible segment that andy townsend had on the short-lived itv show the premiership <laughs> years ago you may remember my yeah. one of my fellow i was going to say one of my fellow countrymen but he's one of those uh He's one of those, those plastic uh, adopted ones. Adopted Irishman, isn't he? <laughs> He's a plastic Irishman. <laughs> yeah. And uh, listen, before I go as well, you talk, you're talk. you talking about uh, Arsenal's uh, length of time before since they've won a European trophy. Let me just say to the Arsenal fans listening in before I go, I hope and I, I pray that you don't get another uh, disappointment in that regard because um, we all know what happened the last time Arsenal were close to winning a European competition. And I'm not, sorry, I, I, <laughs> I just remember 2006 there when Jens Lehmann got himself sent off, but I was more thinking of the former Tottenham player that punished you once upon a time. Do you remember that? Uh, I, I Personally, I don't because I'm too young, but I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember all the children in the playground singing that song. <laughs> Nine from the halfway line. Bad times, bad times. I, you know what? I've seen that replay maybe... 50 times and I still don't understand how the keeper got beat from there but anyway that's a discussion for another day um, David Seaman had form didn't he there, there were occasions I, I seem to recall a, an error against Brazil once upon a time yep. as well for the national team. <laughs> yes yes that's it he, he certainly did have form of that yeah no doubt about that Alan thank you so much thank you for joining me once again and uh, hopefully we can speak again in the very near future hopefully we can get you on again before the season ends yeah, that'd be great. And thanks for having me, Harry. And best of luck. Thanks to Alan O'Brien for his brilliant insight. It's always good to get a neutral's perspective from time to time, just to measure where we're at without the bias, without the emotion. Uh, so huge thanks to Alan for that. Now, my second guest this week is regular contributor Mike Stavrou. This is what he had to say on the win in Naples. Welcome back to the podcast, Mike Stavrou. First of all, how you doing, mate? I'm good, Harry. How you doing, man? Not too bad, not too bad. Pleased uh, after last night's result, of course. Uh, what did you make of the performance, Mike? The overall uh, performance of Unai Emery's side? I don't use this word very often when it comes to Arsenal, Harry, but I'd say professional. I think we came with the right approach because I think we're all saying pre-match, you know, if we kind of go there and look to set up defensively and sit back, then they're just going to pick us apart. What we did, we started on the front foot, which meant that uh, we eventually got the goal and that meant that the game was kind of in our own hands. And I'm just, I'm glad. I mean, over the two legs, I haven't seen Arsenal exert that much control. I have to say, uh, and you'll know a lot more than me about Napoli, Harry, but I was so disappointed. They were rubbish for me. They just had no intensity. There was no 
Do you, do you know what? The, um, I noticed yesterday there was a big hole, um, a big Marek Hamšík sized hole in their midfield. <laughs> it couldn't get any control of, of the game. Like that that four four two system. I think they have been playing with it this season, but they just couldn't. They just couldn't exert any control on the game, and I think that's where we dominate them in midfield. To be honest. Yeah, I mean, um, to be fair, Mike. Like you know, you know how I am, and how you know at times people say that I'm probably overly critical of Arsenal and. The reason I'm like that at times is because I feel that if you have an issue and you just ignore it and you don't call it out, then you don't improve. And and so, you know, I'm always looking for a top level performance from Arsenal. And I agree with you, whilst Arsenal were, were very professional in the way they went about things, Napoli were nowhere near their best. Nowhere near it. There's no doubt about that. Um, and you spoke about intensity there. For me, that's the key point. I think we've seen over these two legs the difference in intensity between the two leagues. And that st- stood Arsenal in good yeah. stead to go on and win this tie very comfortably, in my opinion. Um, I mean, Alexander Lacazette's free kick, though. What a goal. I mean, I was waiting for Granit Xhaka to hit that. Oh, I mean, that is why I was saying he's, he's reinforced as my pick for player of the season. I just think he's such a big game player. There was a stat on Twitter flying around yesterday. He scored against like most of the big teams, United, Chelsea, Liverpool, he just scores big goals in big games. That's the kind of character that he is. And it's kind of nice that we have this this balance. We've got a, a bit of a flat track bully in Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and then the big game player Alex Lacazette. And I'm so glad that they've formed such a good partnership together. And, I mean, what a free kit. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a bit weird because when you're looking at it straight away, you're thinking, oh, the keeper should say that because it's on his side. But two things is that one he he takes a movement to the right which means that any chance of him diving to the left is completely gone he's got no time by the time he decides that and secondly it was such a well-struck free kick it wasn't exactly in the corner but the power and the curve that he gets on I didn't know he could hit a free kick like that to be honest yeah and me too. um yeah but for me he's proved himself as our player of the season I mean I, I just love the guy Harry I mean he's he's hold up play he's link up play he's finishing he the best part about him is his little touches in the box that he's so technically uh, good that he can just get away from anyone and that burst of acceleration and what an important player he's been for us. In your opinion, Mike, how big a blow is that injury to Aaron Ramsey? Oh, it's huge, isn't it? I mean, I've never actually in my life seen a player whose contract is expiring put that much effort and that much passion and desire into their performances. Aaron Ramsey is a saint. I think he's doing it because he feels so much loyalty still to our club, even though we didn't show loyalty to him. And he's really repaying all of us fans. You know, he scored big goals in finals. He's been very good for a sustained period of time. And we will miss him because he's so versatile, Harry. He, he slotted in as a, as a number 10 yesterday. But in previous weeks in big games, he's played next to Granit Xhaka as a number two, which many at the beginning of the season, I think you remember, said that he couldn't do that role. But actually, he can and like, it's going to be a miss. And if anything, it would it's just a shame because we don't get a proper chance to say goodbye to him before he goes to Juve. Yeah, I mean, fingers crossed we do get to see him at least once more in an Arsenal shirt. And, you know, who knows? Maybe he'll be back for the Europa League final and score the winner. Hey-ho, you never know. Um, and, and just finally, Mike, in terms of um, Lauren Koscielny, he's been immense, hasn't he, in these past couple of months or so. And Many question whether he could come back in the side and perform at the top level, given the injury that he uh, suffered last season. And, you know, lots of us were talking about how he was finished and we needed a replacement. I still think we need someone in the long term. But, you know, Lauren Koscielny has really stepped up to the plate, hasn't he? Oh, yeah, he's been fantastic, is not he? I think a real captain's performance. He's, um, yeah, a lot of people, as you did say, said he was finished. But I certainly don't think he is. I think he's got about another year left. I was I was having a chat yesterday with uh, some of my Arsenal fans, and um, we were saying, you know, when we go into the market this summer, we're going to have about five, six um, centre backs with the addition of Callum Chambers when he comes back, and uh, Mavra Panos, obviously a lot youngster if he doesn't get loaned out. I was just thinking, how many of them do we need to shave? I wanted to ask you the question as well. For me, I think if if, if we're looking at Socrates, Koscielny, um Holding, Mustafi, Mavra Panos, and Chambers. I think we need to get rid of a few of them to bring someone else in. Personally, uh, I know a lot of people have been saying, been backing up Mustafi as a sticky yes, but I, for one, he's not. He's moving forward. He's not for me. I would personally get rid of him, and I would probably get rid of Callum Chambers as well because he's not played at this level, and then maybe sign someone else for me. 
I think for me, Callum Chambers is definitely one that I would probably look to move on. And the reason for that, not because I've got anything against the lad, but I just think Callum Chambers at his age, the fact he's British, I think he'll command a fee, whereas some of the others won't. And that fee could obviously contribute towards us bringing someone else in. Um, so, yeah, I think Callum Chambers is the one that first comes to mind when we're talking about moving centre-halves on. Uh, Mike, just to wrap it up there, um, you know, how are you feeling about the semi-final against Valencia? Confident going into that? Uh, yeah, I think they're sixth in La Liga. I haven't been particularly uh, overwhelmingly good this season, but they do have some dangerous players. I know Rodrigo plays for the Spanish team. He's a he's a very dangerous player. So I don't think we can go there thinking, oh yeah, we're through to the final. Um, we we got to basically play it the same way we did Napoli, just be professional first leg. Um, try and keep a clean sheet, which I know has been difficult for us, but we got two on the bounce recently, so maybe, maybe there's a bit of an upturn. I, I don't know, but um, what's in Emery been feeding them? I, I don't know, but we'll, uh, <laughs> hopefully whatever he's feeding them carries on because uh, they've been pretty decent. But uh, yeah, I think we need a professional form to try and keep it to a clean sheet in the first leg and then the second leg uh, when we go to Spain, which is not always easy in an away stadium. Um, with a good atmosphere, we'll need to uh, be professional again. But yeah, I'm, I'm I'm pretty confident. I'm pretty confident we'll see it through, and hopefully Chelsea in the final, which will be should be good. Yep, yeah, uh, be nerve wracking, but it'll be good definitely. Mike, thank you very much for joining me. I know you've got a dash back to work, so uh, we'll catch up again uh, in the very near future. Uh, thanks for joining us. Cheers, Harry. Thank you also to Mike Stavrou for his contribution. Just going to give some of my thoughts uh, in the end. Um, a professional performance from Arsenal, the team, and Unai Emery deserve an immense amount of credit uh, for getting the job done at, out in Naples. It was always going to be a dodgy tie. Um, in my opinion, when the draw came out, it was the most difficult uh, tie that we could have possibly got, in my opinion, with probably Chelsea aside. Um you know, Alan was absolutely right in, in his analysis of the game from a neutral perspective. And it's like I said already, it's always good to get that. It's always good to get the view of someone detached from the club who can, you know, see things for what they are without the emotion, without the anger, etc., etc. Um, I know I keep making that point, but I really, really value Alan's analysis. Also, thank you to Mike for his contribution, which was brilliant too. And he made some fantastic points as well himself. Um but yeah, professional performance, great display. We're on our way to the semi-finals now where we'll play Valencia. It won't be easy. Um, you know, Valencia are a very decent side with some good players as well. Um, but having beaten Napoli the way we did with such ease, um, you know, I'm very, very confident going into the semi-finals. And I think Arsenal can go all the way. I think Chelsea are the team that will probably stand in our way. Now that I'm saying that, they'll probably get knocked out by Eintracht Frankfurt, which I wouldn't mind <laughs> as well. So, um, you know, great result, great professionalism. And, and I know, uh, you know, from my perspective anyway, Unai Emery's taken some criticism of late. But in the last few months, he's probably been as close to flawless as you can be. Um, I think he's got everything right. I do agree with Alan's point in regards to the fact that we were maybe a little bit too tactically flexible at Watford. I didn't think that benefited us. Um, I think we struggled to get a foothold in the game as a result. But what I will say about the Watford example is that that was probably with Napoli in mind. And so you need to take that into consideration as well. A uh, huge thank you to every single one of you for listening. If you're watching via YouTube, hit that like and subscribe button. If you're listening via the audio, whether it's iTunes or whatever, subscribe, like it, share it, comment, review. Uh, reviews are so important on iTunes. So if you are listening via that channel, please, please do so. We will be back on Monday with a uh, review of the Crystal Palace game. Um, fingers crossed we'll be talking about another Arsenal victory. After all, the Emirates Stadium has become a fortress, hasn't it? Uh, hope you all enjoy your Easter. And on behalf of the team here at the Chronicles of Aguna, have a great one uh, and spend some quality time with your families until Arsenal reconvene on Sunday. <laughs>